Kajala Medical presents COVID-19 The Answers, the show that delivers the scientific evidence-based knowledge that can safely return us all to our pre-COVID lives. My name is Dr. Fumi Okanola and I'll be hosting the show. Every week you can listen to me interview a highly respected professional about the science that can reduce your risk of becoming infected with this coronavirus. Hello listeners and welcome to episode one of COVID-19 The Answers. I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Daniel Griffin. Dr. Griffin is a physician scientist, an MD, PhD, Chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at ProHealth New York, the Senior Fellow for Infectious Disease at United Health Group, and a Clinical Instructor of Medicine at Columbia University's Irving Medical Center, where he is also an Associate Research Scientist. He is a speaker and educator who has lectured throughout the world on global health topics, and he is President of Parasites Without Borders and a co-host of the podcast this Week in Virology, or TWIV, of which I am an avid fan and is really one of the inspirations for this podcast series. Dr. Griffin is active in the clinical care of patients living in the New York area and has been particularly involved in the care of patients suffering from COVID-19 since the very beginning of the pandemic. He's going to talk to us today about SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> really happy to have you. Right. So getting right down to bare basics in the questions. SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus. So while the medical and scientific community understand what a virus is, the non-medical people likely don't know. So what is a virus? And why do they now, exist? Now, this is a great place to start. Um, so what is a virus? There's, there's several ways to go about this. You know, uh, us as scientists have our very sophisticated answer. Um, you know, but, but then I think let's try to make it something that's um, accessible. So, um, you know, most of us have been sick. We felt not wonderful. Um, you know, we, we refer to them, oh, what bug am I fighting off? And, and in that context, there are several different pathogens, several different things out there that can make us sick. This One of the simplest of them is the virus. The virus is, is an organism um, that it really is a parasite. It can't do everything itself. It actually has to co-op the machinery of our cells to make us sick, to make animals sick, to make plants sick even. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit maybe later about the types of viruses, but this is one of the simplest in distinction from a bacteria, um, which is a little more complex. They can actually live without us on their own. Um, we have the, the funguses, um, which actually, you know, sometimes we use them to help us brew beer, maybe with wine, things like that, uh, cheese and the like. Um, but sometimes they can make us sick as well. Um, but that's really where viruses fit in. They're, they're one of the three major things that can make us sick. Uh, one of the simplest, it's the virus, a little more complicated, the bacteria, and then even a little more complicated, the fungus. Oh, thank you for that. Now we understand what a virus is. What is a coronavirus and what makes it distinctly different? Well, now we, we dive a little bit deeper and this is okay. <laughs> so um, the way we understand viruses is there's really, I'm going to say, two parts to a virus. There's the inside, there's the outside. Um, the inside is the genetic material. And we really break viruses down into viruses that have RNA as their genetic material, viruses that have DNA as their genetic material. Um, the coronaviruses, they fall into that group where they use RNA as their genetic material. So that's what's inside. Um, but what's on the outside? This is where the name comes from. On the outside of that inner package is the capsid. Um, it's a, a protein capsule um, that surrounds that genetic material. Now, some viruses also have 
a lipid envelope around that. And that lipid envelope for the coronavirus is if you look at it um, under an electron microscope, because these are incredibly tiny, um, it actually looks like the corona of the sun. There's actually these spike proteins that surround uh, that capsid, giving it this appearance, giving it this name. Um, so the coronaviruses, most of us actually have encountered them before. Um, a number of those common colds that plague us are common coronaviruses. Um, in this case, so SARS-CoV-2 is one of those coronaviruses that was not so common. Uh, now I think it's becoming common, um, but makes us quite ill. Oh, that's excellent, Daniel. Thank you. Um, SARS-CoV or SARS-CoV-1 entered the public light in 2003 with much publicity but seem to disappear reasonably quickly in comparison to SARS-CoV-2. So how is SARS-CoV-2 different from SARS-CoV-1? What is the genesis behind the two SARS viruses and why, well, actually you've already answered why they have this name. <laughs> so this, this is a great question. And I think there's, there's a lot that we, we've learned in the last two years. Um, we were lucky with SARS-CoV-1. Um, so just to start, where do they come from? We're going to get back to this again. Um, there are a lot of these coronaviruses that are out there in nature. Um, they're in other animals. Uh, a large number of them are in bats. Uh, some of these type of viruses are in camels and, and little furry mammals and the like. Um, one of the nice things about SARS-CoV-1 was that people were not contagious until they were quite sick. They would start to feel horrible. They would end up in the hospital. Then they were contagious. Um, there are small, subtle changes with SARS-CoV-2, enough to make it actually a different virus, where people start to be contagious before they start to get symptoms, before they start to feel ill. And that's really been the Achilles heel for us. That's been the disaster. SARS-CoV-2, though it made people quite sick, though there was a really high chance of death, those people were not contagious until they were in hospital, until we could keep them isolated, until we could stop that transmission. Mm -hmm. um, but as we've seen with SARS-CoV-2, as we've seen with people that have COVID-19, about half of the transmission is occurring either before a person becomes symptomatic or while they have no symptoms at all. Yes, yes, that's right. Oh, the, um, the general feeling in the community via the media and government seems to be portraying SARS-CoV-2 to be the same as catching a cold or the flu. How would you compare catching SARS-CoV-2 to the flu or a cold? Why isn't this the flu? So I think that a lot of people who are vaccinated, um, who are healthy, you know, that, that does change things. But I think people have to keep that memory. It's only two years ago. Let's remember when people were getting this, they were not vaccinated. We didn't have great therapeutics. Um, and what was happening? About one in five, 20% of people were ending up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. That's not the common cold. That's not the flu. Mm -hmm. We were seeing about one in every 50 people were dying. Um, just here in New York, we were seeing over 2,000 deaths in a single day. Um, again, not the common cold. Um, now, here we're seeing this latest Omicron wave. Um, in a lot of parts of the world, Canada, the United States, parts of Europe, um, not as many places in Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, but areas where a lot of people are vaccinated, if a vaccinated person encounters SARS-CoV-2, gets COVID-19, um, it often can feel like just a bad cold. But for the unvaccinated individuals, we are still seeing a lot of hospitalizations, a lot of deaths. With the Omicron wave, the week for which we have the most recent data for children here in the US, we were seeing three children dying per day. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen hundreds of children die during the Omicron wave. Um, we actually reached a peak of over 3,000 deaths in a single day in the United States from Omicron, certainly not a mild common cold that can kill 3,000 people in a single day. Thank you so much uh, for reminding us of that situation and those num numbers. Um, and to think of the suffering 
of well everybody but in particular children is truly heartbreaking moving on um, there's been a great deal of speculation around the origins of SARS-CoV-2 ranging from animal to human transition in an animal market to a man-made virus produced in a lab what are the origins of SARS-CoV-2 in your opinion yeah, so I, I think this is one of those tough questions, and there, there's unfortunately a lot of political aspect to this. Um, so let, let's focus on what we know. Let's focus on the science, because it is an important question. We do want to know where this came from, um, because we are concerned that there may be future pandemics. In many ways, a lot of us are concerned this may have just been a warning shot over the bow. We may be facing worse um, pathogens, worse pandemics in the future. Um, some of the early discussions were focused on this idea that you could look at the virus and see clues suggesting that it had been made in a lab, made by human beings. Um, you know, when we've actually looked at it, we're not seeing that that's true. And a lot of the scientists who initially were quoted have gone back and said, you know, when you actually look at it, no. One of the big things that people looked at was this furin cleavage site, um, a word that I used to think only virologists would use. Um, but now it's something that's bantered over, you know, the holiday table with family. Um, initially, this was some smoking gun, but we now realize almost every subclass of the coronaviruses have furin cleavage sites. That's nothing atypical. That's nothing shocking. Um, we, at this point, um, have moved to where we realize this probably came from an animal source, um, perhaps from a bat. Um, interesting enough, the people who are still focused on the lab said, so, well, maybe that bat first went to the lab, and then someone <laughs> took it home and gave it to someone else. Well, no evidence, actually, that that happened. Um, what we suspect is that this is a virus that has been circulating in bat populations in Southeast Asia. At some point, it got into the human population. Um, when we have our um, scientists look at these animals, when we do these animal sampling, um, it looks like there are potential other viruses that can cross over from animals. So <clears throat> I do think this is an important question, not only where did this virus come from, but also what are the viruses are out there in nature lurking. I do not think this was created by a scientist or any way a malicious mad scientist attack upon humanity. Thank you for that. And um, I, don't, I know you're not a zoologist, but bats do contain a lot, uh, carry around a lot of viruses that could be dangerous to us, but have no effect on them. I think it would be interesting um, in the future. And I think there are studies looking at that because it might bring clues to how we could protect ourselves uh, against the immunity that they seem to have. Yeah, I would agree wholeheartedly. Bats, bats are fascinating. I actually find them quite cute. Um, but no, they, <clears throat> they're quite different than us because they're so metabolically active. They have a whole different immune system. Uh, they have a whole different interaction with viruses, with illnesses. Um, and, you know, I think unless we uh, really put our resources um, into this ahead of time, we're going to end up putting a lot of resources into this after the fact um, during another pandemic. Indeed. I'm not sure the public distinguishes between SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Please help us to understand the difference between the two. Yeah, I, I, it would have been nice if we all got together and, and planned the naming a little bit better. <laughs> it's, always, it, it's always nice. Like with polio, you have polio disease, polio the virus. Mm. Um, but uh, in, in this case, um, initially, the terminology was novel coronavirus. And then it ended up getting, you know, named as a disease, COVID-19, um, but the virus. And so here's, here's really to cut to the chase. The virus that makes us sick, the name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. The disease, the I'm sick, I have the COVID-19. So COVID-19 is the disease. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is the cause of that disease. Thank you for that clarity. Uh, we toss around the word pandemic as a description of what we have experienced in the last two years. To help us understand the current global situation, let's start with the definition of a pandemic. What is a pandemic? Okay, certainly. Um, you know, my, my dad always tells me, like, think about what the words mean, and, and we can break this word down. Um, and really, 
pan is the big thing that helps us here. Um, pan is really referring to something that is involving the whole world, much of the world, all around, um, not just a localized epidemic. So that's really the distinction we're making. Um, an epidemic would be if there was a problem just in Canada, for instance. A pandemic is when you start involving many, many countries, when it starts to become around the world. Um, but there's another distinction in here, which everyone is really starting to ask about now. <clears throat> when does this go from not pandemic to epidemic, but when does it go from pandemic to endemic? When do we stop having these huge surges that overwhelm our healthcare systems? Um, when do we stop having people show up at ERs and they can't get treated with a, a twisted ankle or having a heart attack or, you know, some other horrible thing? Um, and that has a lot to do with getting those numbers down and getting numbers to a predictable level where we have expectations um, and are able to bring resources to bear to do that. Um, we are thinking in many parts of the world, we may be making that last transition. We don't think SARS-CoV-2 is ever going to be localized to just one part of the world, so the pan part, um, but we do think it's going to transition from a pandemic level to an endemic level, probably settle into a seasonal pattern um, where in certain parts of the world, the times that more people are inside and together, let's take the rainy season in certain parts of the world. Let's take the winter in other um, parts of the world where people are inside. We'll be seeing higher rates then. Times when people are outdoors, the dry season, the summer, um, then we'll be seeing lower levels. And a lot of this is based upon our understanding of how this transmits, the fact that this is a respiratory viruses and many of the coronaviruses with which this is similar have settled into that seasonal pattern. So do you think that we're at that stage now? Do you think that we're at the endemic stage now? I think we're nearing it in certain parts of the world. And I think that that's the big challenge for us when I say in certain parts of the world. Mm. With the latest Omicron surge um, here in, in the West, here in Canada and the United States, actually much through Europe as well, um, we have a large percent of people now who are either vaccinated or recently infected. We have a lot of therapeutics on the horizon, um, just increasing access that will allow people, should they get infected, to stay out of the hospital. Again, getting it below that limit that's going to overwhelm our healthcare systems. But still, that inequity, there's many parts of the world where they're continuing to do everything they can to be safe, but they don't have that great advantage of access to vaccines. Um, and while that continues, that puts not only those individuals at risk, but the rest of the world at risk, at risk of more variants, more challenges to that wonderful protection that vaccines afford us. I see. So even though the rates of hospitalization are high at the moment, the death rates are high in places like the state, you think we're moving towards an endemic phase at this moment in time? Um, I, I think we're moving. I don't think we're there yet. I think that's really important. We're not there yet, mm. but we are moving. Um, I suspect we'll get a little bit of a bump. We have a big athletic event coming up here in the U.S. And whenever we have a holiday, whenever we have a reason for a bunch of people to be all gathered together, we see a little bit of a rise. Um, but we are heading towards warmer weather. We're expecting numbers to come down for a while, but we do expect numbers to rise again next fall. And when they do rise, Instead of people ending up in the hospital, some people will be able to stay out because they've been vaccinated. Some people will also stay out because they'll have access to medications, therapeutics that keep them out. Um, you know, hopefully as we move forward, those numbers will keep moving in, in the right direction. So I see where you're coming from and how there's the difference. Um, so basically, if you're in a rich Western country, um, well-resourced country that has access to vaccines readily, treatments readily, you can you, you feel that there can be an exercise on the control of, of, of the virus. Um, we can somehow minimize the outbreaks or possibly even eliminate them if we have a high enough proportion of the population vaccinated. I'm, am I correcting in that? Situation? As painful as it is, the way you word that, you're wording it correctly. Um, in privileged parts of the world, where we have the ability to um, vaccinate, not only once, but twice, but now three times, um, certain higher risk people, maybe even a fourth vaccine, where we have access to therapeutics that might be six or $800 or even $2,000 for a course, um, talking about the antivirals and the monoclonals. Um, it's a much different situation than some parts of the world where 
less than 1% of the population has access to vaccines where those expensive therapeutics are out of reach. Um, so really a lot of inequity here that we really need to address. Mm, thank you for that clarification. Excellent answer, really. Um, we've had three pandemics in the last 20 years. Uh, HIV AIDS, which is ongoing from the 1980s, and I know is a research um, a specialist research area for yourself. Um, H1N1 swine flu influenza in 2009, and now COVID-19. How are these pandemics different from the 1918 to 1920 Spanish flu or the bubonic plague of the 14th century that have occurred previously? All right, so we're going to need a whole podcast for just that question, but let's go into it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this, this is for, and I really appreciate that you bring this up. Uh, let's start with HIV AIDS. Um, it's really tough. I still remember seeing a movie surviving the pandemic, and I was quite shocked because this pandemic, that pandemic, it is not over. Um, there are over 30 million people in the world living with HIV. In the United States, we have over a million people living with HIV. Um, wow. This is not a pandemic that we've gotten through. We continue to see um, large numbers of people getting infected every year. We continue to see hundreds of thousands of deaths. So we are still in that pandemic. What was really tough about that pandemic was this us them view, this idea that this was not our pandemic, that it was a pandemic of other people, that somehow it was those people's fault. Um, I think that was an incredible challenge. I personally uh, grew up in Greenwich Village. My mother was very involved with activism, uh, worked with some of the ACT UP activists, worked with a young Anthony Fauci at that point. Wow. Um, so very personally, still very troubling to me um, that, that people don't remember, that people don't realize that this is an ongoing challenge. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, those were some of the differences, right? It was not a respiratory pathogen. Mm -hmm. um, it was not embraced as our problem as a global community. Um, hopefully that is improving. Um, now let's move to influenza. That was slightly different and actually has a lot of similarities here, right? Respiratory virus. Um, it was actually not just um, focusing on elderly, but we were actually seeing younger individuals um, dying at higher rates than we were used to with uh, prior influences. Um, this is something also that got to the point where it was stressing but not overwhelming um, our healthcare systems. Um, but what did we have? Lots of experience with vaccines. Um, we had therapeutics. Mm -hmm. It was a disease that we were familiar with, not as frightened by. We understood transmission. Um, a lot of big differences. When we ran into COVID-19, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of panic, and there still is. People throwing different therapies at it, just hoping, wanting to believe desperately that they could make a difference, mm -hmm. um, really quite a difference. And going back to the 1918, well, that's kind of very similar to what we experienced um, and are still experiencing. A lot of fear. There were no vaccines. There were no therapeutics. What, not even quite sure about how it was being transmitted. There were, um, there were masks. There were even anti-mask protests. There were really a lot of similarities. And actually, we're seeing sort of the tail end similarities. People talk about how that uh, influenza pandemic ended, but people continued to die when people had just finally reached a point where they were exhausted. They no longer wanted to hear or read about it or take any more measures. So unfortunately, I think we're, we're reaching that social exhaustion phase here while COVID-19 in the U.S. is still on some days killing over 2,000 individuals. Wow, wow. And I guess with the bubonic plague, the numbers were just phenomenal. I think the numbers of deaths, I think they went into the hundreds of millions, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, the bubonic plague, overwhelming in many ways, um, mm -hmm. just because the mortality was so high. I mean, some estimate a third of people in Europe died. Um, but then again, we had bubonic plague in China while the West was busy fighting World War I, the Chinese asked for assistance. We couldn't offer any because we were busy doing what we were doing. So um, bubonic plague is, you know, we always hear about it, think about it and focus on Europe, but this was um, a global issue. Well, I didn't realize that about China. And thank you again for another excellent answer. Um, okay, we now understand what a pandemic is and how the current pandemic is different uh, from past pandemics. 
At the initial stage of the pandemic, there was so much unknown about the transmissibility of the virus and public health initiatives were inconsistent and often lacking specific direction. We now know more about the virus. With that in mind, in your opinion, how is SARS-CoV-2 transmitted? So I think one of the biggest challenges and one of the things I hope we learned from this pandemic <clears throat> is the importance of, of communication, let's say science communication, public health communication. Um, this is a respiratory virus. Um, you don't get this by surfaces. Very uncommon that it's spread by surfaces. You don't get this by swimming in a pool. You get this by breathing. You get this, this is a respiratory virus and you acquire it by exposure to your respiratory system, um, breathing it into your nose, breathing it into your mouth. Um, so I, I love the, there was an article by Roxanne Comsey where she says, it may not be airborne, but it's borne by the air. Um, <laughs> this distinction of airborne is, is a very confusing, scientific, uh, in-hospital infection control distinction that just did nothing but muddy the waters. Um, if you are a little bit away, you decrease your risk to some degree, you get a little farther away, that's better. But once you get in a closed indoor situation, um, nowhere is safe. It, it's circulating around. Um, most of our transmission, we realize probably is occurring in these indoor settings because what do people do indoors? They breathe. Mm -hmm. There isn't great ventilation. There isn't great dilution effects. Um, so yeah, this is a respiratory virus. Um, I do want people to keep washing their hands, but to be honest, um, it's the breathing air, particularly in a closed indoor space with someone who is infected, someone who is letting the virus out. We do know that really, really high concentrations are in your nose. So when we're asking people to mask, if you're not covering your nose, you're not wearing a mask. Mm, very excellent point. Um, and I do see the 25% of people wearing their masks under their nose. So thank you for <laughs> making that, that point. Um, and also we, uh, we have Professor uh, Jimenez coming uh, on uh, later on in the series to talk all about uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the air. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. <laughs> um, right, I'm just getting to the... At the start of the pandemic, um, the R naught for ancestral SARS-CoV-2 was two to three versus the highly contagious measles at 15 to 18. Today with Omicron, the virus is rated second only to measles in terms of contagion with an R naught of eight to 15. In simple terms, how would you explain R naught and RT, the transmissibility measurement? Okay. So th this is, I think, really important. And, you know, maybe another silver lining of the pandemic is, is everyone is interested in learning these things. Um, so R is just short for reproductive number. And really, if a person, one person has the infection, on average, how many other people do they spread it to? Um, but it gets a little complicated. So we'll go into that. The R naught is when you know nothing and do nothing. So it's no mitigation, no masks, no medicine, no vaccine. So R naught is what is the average from one person? How much are they going to spread without any mitigation? So that R naught is only going to exist early on in Wuhan, China, before we figure out anything about the virus. R sub T is what is going on at this specific point in time. And these are hard to calculate because one thing we haven't really talked about is the reproductive time, the time of that reproductive cycle. So let's take the original Wuhan ancestral strain. Um, original estimates before we knew what was going on was that on average, one person would infect two to three other people. So that was the R naught, the reproductive number. Then on average, those three people would each infect another three people, you're up to nine before you know it. Um, the reproductive time was about seven days from the time that first person was exposed to the time they could spread it to the next group of people. Mm -hmm. What we've seen, and a huge issue with Omicron, is with each new variant, that reproductive time has diminished. So if you start asking in the original ancestral strain, in about a week, one person would on average spread it to three people. But now we're seeing that with Omicron, that reproductive time has dropped to probably only about three days, maybe three to four. So in that one week, it's had a chance to have two reproductive cycles. So even if you still stuck with that original three, 
Now it's had a chance to do that twice. You're up to nine from a single individual in just a matter of a week. So the RT per week can appear to be tripled. Um, one of the challenges um, is that we are seeing over time the shortening of that reproductive time. Um, that R sub T um, can be changed, can be challenged by vaccines. We can reduce it with masking and a lot of other measures. That was fantastic. You've, I'm learning so much in this program too. That's the clearest answer I have ever had. Thank you, Daniel. Um, there are three different phases of contagiousness with this coronavirus. Please talk about one, asymptomatic, two, pre-symptomatic, and three, symptomatic transmission. Okay. So the, the easiest is to break out the pre-symptomatic from the symptomatic. And this is really distinct from the asymptomatic. Some people never, ever get symptoms. But those people, as we know, can still transmit the viruses. So let's, let's, let's go there for starters. An individual gets exposed. There's a certain incubation time where they've been exposed, but they don't have enough virus to spread it to another individual. Um, as mentioned early on, that was about seven days. With Omicron, it may only be three to four. Then the person reaches a point where they never know it. They never have symptoms, but they have enough virus that they can spread it to someone else. That would be our asymptomatic transmission. Now, the other, and this is a challenge for us as well, is before you start getting symptoms, SARS-CoV-2 can already be at a high enough level that one to two days before you feel bad, if you're eventually going to feel bad, you can already be spreading it to other people. This could be that period of asymptomatic transmission. Because you don't feel bad, you might be going to school. You might be going to the office. You might be going to that big birthday party for your 90-year-old grandmother. And so what we now know is that about 50% of the transmission is occurring in those asymptomatic individuals and those pre-symptomatic individuals. That still leaves a chunk, about 50% of transmission, people starting to feel bad that first day or two, maybe probably out to day five, but really diminishing out to day 10. When you're not feeling well, you're coughing, you're sneezing, and you again can transmit. Um, SARS-CoV-1 only was transmitted during that when I feel sick phase. Mm -hmm. Influenza, again, really not much transmission until you feel sick. So really this asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, I feel fine, but can still spread it to others. That has really been a disaster and a challenge for us with COVID-19. Thank you. Let's move to discussing variants. The virus appears to be evolving. We started with the original or ancestral strain of SARS-CoV-2 from Wuhan. There have been many variants, but several variants of concern from Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta to now Omicron. Please help us understand um, what is a variant and how is this different from a mutation? Well, one thing I'll say, and I think this is really important, and this is um, humility all across the board for scientists. We initially looked at coronavirus and said, this is a fairly stable virus. We're not expecting changes. We're not expecting variants. Wow. Um, early on, it was spreading. There were maybe seven changes seen throughout the entire world. We thought we, we had this beat. And then we started to see these changes. So let's, let's go back to what we all learned about with viruses. This is a virus. The genetic material inside is RNA. <clears throat> that RNA, um, every three bases of that RNA codes for a certain amino acid. Those amino acids are going to build those proteins. Um, and those are proteins that we're all familiar with. The spike protein the nucleocapsid, right? That's that structural protein around. Um, the RNA polymerase, the one that actually we're targeting with some of our drugs now. Um, what we have seen over time is there is a certain amount of pressure, selection pressure um, on a random background of changes where a change is actually advantageous for that virus. As we talked about, one of the advantages might be that instead of it taking seven days to go from one person to the next, it might only take five or four or down to maybe three. Mm -hmm. So we start off with changes in the RNA 
that result in changes in the amino acids that result in changes in that protein. If the RNA changes and you can have changes that are silent that don't change the protein, we really don't see them. We don't care about them. Mutations are in the RNA, amino acid changes. We call them mutations. We probably shouldn't. We upset our scientific colleagues, um, but changes in those amino acids, people have come to call those mutations. Um, that's when we start seeing antibody evasion, when we start seeing viruses that can't be neutralized if you recently were infected by Delta, as we saw when Omicron came on the scene. Um, so the initial variants of interest, we noticed some changes, variants of concern when those changes were significant to really change the biology, to change the fitness of the virus, to either allow it to have a shorter reproductive time, allow it to have the ability to evade immunity, whether it's vaccine or prior infections. Thank you. Why, I think you've already answered this um, partially, this question. So um, I think you've already answered why SARS-CoV-2 develops variants. Do you have any sense of what potential future variants could be? You know, we, we are concerned that there will continue to be variants um, because one is we do realize that coronaviruses change over time and it isn't just SARS-CoV-2. We've, we've really started to look more closely at the other coronaviruses and they change over time. Um, the polymerase, it, it makes errors. You end up with a copy of the RNA that's a little bit different. Um, and sometimes that little bit different can be helpful. So what are, what are the big drivers now? Um, we're seeing a subvariant of Omicron where again, slightly shorter reproductive time, right? So to go from one person to the next, maybe even a little quicker than we saw with Omicron. So that's one bit of pressure. The other big pressure that we saw with Omicron is the ability to reinfect people who were infected before, and also the ability to infect people who were vaccinated but not boosted, to try to get around that. So we call immune evasion. Um, there really isn't a lot of selective pressure to make people sicker. It's all about the virus becoming fitter, the virus being able to outcompete other variants, um, the virus being able to get into those respiratory niches and make people sick. Mm. This is such a rich conversation and, you know, we're so privileged to have a person such as yourself with such specialist knowledge being part of this program. Really would like to thank you. Um, so the scientific community identifies variants by genomic sequencing. What is genomic sequencing and how has it been applied in this pandemic? So the, the timing of this question is perfect because we are celebrating 50 years since the discovery of the reverse transcriptase. So um, what do we do? We take the RNA and we use this enzyme that was discovered in David Baltimore's lab, youngest Nobel Prize winner, I think. Wow. Um, and what you do is you copy that RNA to DNA and we are able to read the sequence of the DNA, which corresponds to that original RNA, really sort of a photographic negative of the RNA sequence. So around the world, um, thousands of labs, millions of sequences have been generated. Um, we take one of those samples. People are now familiar with either the front of the nose, maybe the brain biopsy sample, that beautiful test that we do. Um, that sample then goes off. That genetic material, that RNA is isolated. It's reverse transcribed to DNA. And then we read the sequence with our sequencing machines. Um, these go into these huge databases where they're being analyzed. Some parts of the world do a tremendous job of generating lots of sequences, getting them into these big databases and tracking it. So that's genomic. We are, we are sequencing the genome of this RNA virus. Thank you. The length of time from infection to a person being contagious appears to have changed with Omicron, as you cited a couple of weeks ago on TWIV. How long does it take for a human being to become contagious with SARS-CoV-2 when first infected now? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately now we're seeing, and I've touched on this a few times, it may only be as little as three days. With the ancestral Wuhan um, variant, uh, we were seeing probably about seven days. Um, you know, maybe people were a little bit 
you know, contagious a little bit before that day seven, but really about seven days between one person and the next. With alpha, it dropped a little. With delta, it dropped more. And then we're down to three to four from Omicron. We first started noticing this, we're, well, right after a very interesting um, ritual celebration event we have here in New York City called SantaCon, where apparently people dress up as Santa Claus and go from bar to bar. Um, this occurred on a Saturday night. We started seeing positives as early as Monday and Tuesday, wow. really alerting us that something was different about the reproductive cycle time with Omicron. So really very quickly, people were getting exposed. Within two to three days, we were starting to see positive tests appear. I've also um, read some research whereby um, uh, people get symptoms with Omicron, um, are using the rapid antigen tests, uh, which uh, show up as being negative. And then several days, um, sometimes when the symptoms are sort of easing, they're, they're testing positive. Um, and this seems to have happened with Omicron. Can you um, provide some light on that? Yeah, so I think this, this is excellent. This will be our public service for people to think about how to use those tests properly. Um, we had a lot of ideas on this. Um, you know, early on, we talked about how people would be positive for a day or two before symptom onset. Um, but now we started to see that people were getting symptoms and then not getting that positive test until the next day. Um, early on with the ancestral strain, we had higher levels just right before symptoms occurred than when symptoms started to occur. When symptoms occurred, it was already on the way down. Mm. Um, recent challenge study in the UK looking at this, we, we had hoped, that, oh, it's because people are vaccinated, it's because their immune system is ramping up, maybe it's prior infection, um, but that recent data really confirms that this, this dynamic, um, the first day that you start to feel crummy is not the best time to go ahead and do that test. Um, give it a day, see how you're doing. It's that second day when you're going to have the best sensitivity for those rapid tests. So we have a challenge in our pediatric offices, right? Mom brings in Johnny. Johnny started to feel bad last night. And now mom wants to know, can he go to school? The answer is no. <laughs> the answer is we do a test right away. Even if that's negative, um, we're going to send off a PCR or we're going to retest the next day when we have our sensitivity. So um, don't, don't think that one test predicts the future. Think about the timing of when the best time to do that test is. And it's really after a full 24 hours of symptom onset. Okay. Are we also seeing with Omicron that people are contagious for a longer period of time, even if, if, if vaccinated? Um, I read somewhere that, um, uh, from a few specialists on Twitter, that uh, that we can have a situation whereby when you're vaccinated, where you can be contagious for uh, up to maybe nine, 10 days. And if you're unvaccinated, possibly up to 20 days. Um, have you, do you feel there's any relevance in that? So I don't think it's true. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. And I think it's great that this comes up. One of the things that hopefully, and, and maybe people listen to TWIV after this, one of the things we always try to talk about is the difference between RNA and viable, contagious, infectious virus. So if an individual is vaccinated and they get exposed and they get infected, they can still have really high levels of RNA they can still have significant levels of infectious virus. But what we're seeing is that RNA comes down quicker in someone who's been vaccinated than someone who's not. And we also see the resolution of infectious viable virus coming down much quicker. So I know people are still getting positive antigen tests. They're still getting PCRs well out but they're ceasing to have infectious transmissible virus. If vaccinated, probably after about five days. Unvaccinated, probably after about nine or 10 days. Okay, so that makes it very difficult to interpret an antigen test in those scenarios. It's really hard to interpret an antigen test to try to end your quarantine. So if you start to feel sick and your antigen test is positive, um, for five days, you're probably infectious. We recommend being careful for about 10 days. Um, 
I don't know, here in the US, we've actually said those first five days, you stay at home. If you're gonna go out the next five, wear that tight fitting mask, don't go out to dinner, don't do any risky behavior, you might continue to be contagious, but really it's those unvaccinated people that are most risk after those first five days. So really hard with a PCR, even really hard with an antigen test to say I'm no longer contagious because they may continue to be positive even after you're no longer contagious. Once an antigen test turns negative, um, incredibly unlikely that you still would be transmitting contagious for others. Thank you. And I think you're going to have Michael Mina on to discuss a little bit more about testing and this whole dynamic. That's right. That's right. That's the <laughs> end of March and we'll okay. go into great detail about that. Yes. Thank you. Um, right. And so you've partially answered this question, but I'm quite interested in hearing the detail a little bit more. Um, so can you talk about the difference in contagion from the original SARS-CoV-2 to Omicron and whether you believe this is a result of our immune response via vaccination, our immune response via infection from the virus, a viral mutation, or a combination of all three? So I'm kind of asking you why we've had these changes. Yeah. yeah, you know, the biggest reason we're continuing to have variants is every time you allow an individual to get infected, um, every time you allow a person to have reproduction of the virus, it's a roll of the dice. It's another chance for the virus to stumble across an advantageous change. Um, so having huge um, numbers of the population exposed, having huge numbers of people get infected, um, that's going to create opportunities for change. The other is really the issue of not having people vaccinated. If you have a vaccinated population, it's going to give the virus a lot less rolls of the dice. Um, as we talked about, a lot less chance for that virus, a lot less time for that virus to create viable infectious virus with advantageous, advantageous changes to go on to the next individual. What vaccines are doing, they're really shortening that period of time that the virus can roll the dice, that the virus can potentially stumble onto another advantageous uh, change. So what is creating variants? Um, a lot of it, unfortunately, I think is global vaccine inequity. Mm -hmm. All these areas of the world where instead of the people having the advantages of vaccines to shut down that virus quicker, we are seeing people get infected, we're seeing people get reinfected, um, and we're seeing this just tremendous pool of viruses potentially changing and finding uh, some way to either transmit faster, short that reproductive cycle, get from one individual to more people in a shorter period of time, or even evade the immune defenses. Mm. Yes, and um, to give another plug, we do have uh, Mr. David Morley, who's the president and CEO of UNICEF, and Dr. Anna Banerjee, um, infectious disease specialist and pediatrician, coming on in a few weeks' time to talk about global vaccine equity. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up, and do stay tuned, listeners. Um, you've answered quite a lot of, of my questions already. Thank you, Daniel, but I have another one here. So SARS-CoV-2 has been detected in cats, mink, and deer, likely as a result of transmissions from humans to animal. Do you think there could be a mutation in these animals that's transferred back to humans, leading to a worse variant? It is certainly a concern. Um, you know, we, we do think, um, getting back to the origin question, that SARS-CoV-2 originally came from a non-human source, got into the human population, and now we're seeing it go from humans into um, all these other animals. Um, and there is certainly the potential, and there's even a discussion now, was Omicron from an individual who's immunocompromised, who could not clear the virus, maybe that's what, I'm, or is this an advantageous change that developed in a mouse or some other non-human mammal and then came back to us. So unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of animals get SARS-CoV-2, develop their form of COVID-19. Um, this is one of those reasons why, unfortunately, we don't think um, COVID-19 is ever going to go away. Um, there'll always be a large percentage of people who are not vaccinated, unfortunately. There will also be all these animals that are potential reservoirs for a cross-back phenomenon. Mm. So we've covered a lot of ground today. Recognizing that you don't have a crystal ball and the virus has proven to evolve and adapt very quickly, 
What does the future for this coronavirus look like in your opinion? And any best guess on how long it could last? Well, I, I am to some degree optimistic, um, but regionally optimistic. It's really up to us, you know, what happens in the future. Um, you know, we do think in certain parts of the world, um, particularly in certain areas where we have um, high vaccine uptake, um, that at least going forward, the amount of serious disease, the amount of deaths and hospitalizations will be lower. Um, we don't expect COVID-19 to go away. Um, we do expect next winter there to again be a number of cases. We do expect deaths to be in the hundreds again. Um, now, the big challenge for us is what happens globally? What are we going to do? And uh, I love the plug for global vaccine equity. What are we going to do? Are we going to continue to create areas where new variants can develop? or are we gonna address the inequity issues? So a lot of what happens in the next year is really in our hands. Um, I know we're done with the virus. I know we're fed up, um, but the virus is not done with us. It's not fed up with us. It, it likes this um, to anthropomorphize there. Um, so if we're gonna have a good um, winter next year, um, it's gonna really be people making smart decisions because we certainly can make bad decisions and uh, set us up for more trouble in the future. That's an excellent answer. Thank you. Our responsibility. Um, speculating going forward, will there be a SARS-CoV-3 or other viruses that will affect humanity to this magnitude in the future? So yes, um, you know, we, we virologists, epidemiologists, infectious disease specialists, um, you know, have been talking about the, the risk um, for our population, um, you know, encroaching on uh, different areas where there are viruses, where there are animals with viruses. Um, we expected it to be worse. We expected um, it to have a higher mortality when we got hit. So unfortunately, a lot of us think that this pandemic may have just been a shot over the bow. Um, you know, 2% mortality pre-vaccines, pre-therapeutics um, is not 10%. It's not 20%. It's not where we saw with SARS-CoV-1. Um, it's not the plague numbers that we saw. Um, so no, unfortunately, if we don't do the right thing, if we don't invest in science, in therapeutics, in technology, um, it's really just a question of when we have another um, infectious challenge, when we have another pandemic, um, what type of virus that will be, um, how prepared or not. Mm, that's sobering. Um, and I like the use of the term we. Um, it's been so much a situation in the past where illness has happened to people over there and you send some money, you might go on a march, you might even write to your local politician, but you were happy in your wealthy country. But now with the pandemic, we have to think of we and everybody, I think. And I like the way that you've really stressed that. No, I think that that's critical. And I do hope we realize that we, we live in one world. Um, there's no there's no borders um, to, to the air. Um, the whole idea that we could shut down air travel and somehow keep something isolated in, in a quarter of the world, that doesn't work with respiratory viruses. It doesn't work with something that has an incubation period where it can be two to 14 days from exposure to the time that you might transmit to someone else. So um, I think it's really critical for our future that we embrace the fact that we're one people, we live in one world. Um, and if we don't address that, um, we all suffer. Thank you. On a positive note, Daniel, um, what aspects of this pandemic have truly inspired you? Well, I, I am impressed. Um, a lot of people's um, sort of true quality have come out. I mean, just, just to see the, the sacrifices, um, you know, we'll talk about the healthcare workers early on. There was fear. Um, you know, we did not know, healthcare workers did not know um, how to stay safe. We weren't really sure how this was transmitted, but yet day in and day out, millions of individuals were there taking care of sick people, holding their hands, talking to them, um, providing care, um, particularly, you know, nurses, all the like, you know, people who are really hands-on in there. So just tremendous to, to realize that, that human beings can, can dig deep. We really are just a compassionate, caring, um, group of individuals. So that was, that was tremendous. And the scientists, you know, who would have thought in a year 
we could have such effective, powerful tools, the vaccines. Uh, you know, everyone was shocked how quickly that came, but that didn't happen overnight. That was decades of people working, people struggling to get funding, people told that their ideas were crazy and would never work, but now we're seeing the fruits of, of that determination and that hard work, that talent, um, and the people that believed in them and supported them and kept them going forward. So. Um, just really been impressive to, to work um, and to connect with so many just tremendous, wonderful people over the last couple of years. Mm. Well, thank you for pointing that out. And I must say, listeners that, um, and watchers, that uh, Daniel, Dr. Daniel Griffin was one of those people. Um, he's been a true inspiration. I've been listening to TWIV since near the beginning of the pandemic. Um, he now has a weekly update dedicated um, that's uh, been a real source of knowledge uh, for us uh, uh, physicians and other professionals throughout the world. I strongly suggest that you listen to it. Um, Micro TV does some amazing work and has lots of great uh, channels. Uh, uh, Professor Vincent Racanello even has uh, a, a whole program, a whole course on YouTube about viruses. So I'm giving them an enormous plug because they enormously deserve it. I want to thank you, uh, uh, Daniel, for joining us today and giving such a comprehensive comprehensive and excellent overview of SARS-CoV-2 and, and providing true clarity for all of us. Um, I don't know if you have anything to say today, anything more to say today. No, thank, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you everyone for taking this time out of your lives to, to learn. And hopefully uh, this is something that people now appreciate. It's really critical um, that we know about, that we focus on. So we don't find ourselves in this situation again. And hopefully everyone be safe, be well. Thank you. And please join us next week when we have Dr. Daniel Griffin again talking about COVID-19. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of COVID-19 The Answers. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe, rate and review and do visit our website kajalamedical.com forward slash COVID-19 The Answers.